Hello, here we are again, live streaming, and I've got Jack Lawton back in. What do you prefer, Jack, the hot seat or the comfortable armchair of LinkedIn Live and YouTube? Ooh, well, I mean, the comfortable armchair would probably be nice, wouldn't it? But <laughs> with the questions <laughs> that I might be getting, maybe it's more of a hot seat. I think we're going to find out later on whether or not you're in the hot seat or uh, whether we can uh, ease back with a proverbial whiskey this afternoon. Wonderful topic that you've suggested and that we've chosen is this, how do you build a high-performing data science team? Wow. I mean, how do you build a high-performing team is one side of this. And then what are the differences about making a data science team? I'd love to get into some of these topics with you today. We'll see how time permits. But we got so much to talk about. Individual contributors stepping up to be leaders, trust, authenticity, loyalty, connecting back the work to the business, um, diversity, language, the big picture, knowing when to reflect, knowing when to hit go, knowing when good enough is good enough and knowing when it isn't. And then hopefully we'll get time to talk about the fact we're all distributed now, leading a distributed team of data scientists, the kind of leadership models and teamwork and um, autonomy and trust. So do you agree we've got a lot to talk about? Uh, certainly, yes. I don't <laughs> know if we're going to get through all of that. End, like, all the time, I'm always questioning, you know, are we doing this in the best way? Could we do this better? Like, how do I build this team? And it, it's it's an ever-evolving landscape, as I suppose data science is technically. You know, it, it brings increasing demands on what you have to do day to day. Uh, you look at stuff like uh, AutoML is a huge one at the moment, right? You've got this capability to essentially automate a data scientist, you know, which yeah, I think if you look at the lists of like, jobs that are most at risk of automation, the data scientist is right up near the top. But then it's kind of a bit of an oxymoron. Like, well, aren't the data scientists the ones that are doing the automation to get themselves out of a job? <laughs> uh, but actually, what I think it is, is it's, re it's changing what the core skills of a data scientist are, sort of in the day to day business context. Obviously, you still need people who are going to write and maintain those clever automobile algorithms. But in terms of your day to day business data scientists, their job's a little bit different now. And I think it's actually a benefit because it allows them to spend a lot more time working on you know the business context of the problem they're solving and less on actually the nitty gritty of well, which algorithm should I use and how should I tune my hyper parameters. But that'll be a big change for a lot of people that won't necessarily be comfortable. So this is the bar lifting, isn't it, on all data science projects, the, the tide rising and lifting all ships, that there's less groundwork to do with algorithms now. A lot of them, and you'll tell me if I, I don't use the right terminology, but kind of off the shelf, so to speak, be able to apply them. Um, but that that puts pressure in two areas, doesn't it? One in terms of um, the downstream ramifications of the work and also the upstream in terms of the data that's going to go into those. So does that allow more time for teams to focus on those two areas than in the past? Uh, I mean, absolutely, I would say that. I think you look at what you almost think to be doing as a data scientist. I remember when I got into the field, I thought, oh, it's all algorithms, it's all hyperparameter tuning, or should I use a regression? Should I use Lasso, Ridge, all of this stuff? But then, you know, actually, you find you spend the majority of your time, you know, dealing with the data, getting the data into the right place where it can actually be used in these algorithms. Uh, and that's just, it's not not a data scientist role, if you know what I mean. You know, just because you have the data doesn't necessarily mean it's always appropriate to model with. You know, this is where you get to come to things like privacy that like we were talking about last time. You know, making sure that you're actually putting the appropriate features into your model that it can give you the right output, considering the right factors that you want to consider. And those are also very important parts of the job, but they've not, previously been in the spotlight really quite as much as I think they're going to be. Let's talk about rock stars for a minute. Do we still have those? Do we still need those? Or do we need people to do a little less of the sexy work and a bit more of the groundwork? Well, why do you think I'm growing my hair around? Like, rock star, right? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, though. Um, <laughs> I think that th there's always going to be rock stars. I think you know, very by human nature, people are going to sort of you know, there are going to be those standout individuals who kind of work like ninjas or pirates um, within their organizations. Um, and they do a lot of good work and it's valuable. Um, but are they key to a successful team? Probably in a lot of cases, they can be counterproductive, right? When you've got all of this great stuff that's all focused around one person. Uh, and I think you do have a lot of problems in data science where often data scientists, they come from academic backgrounds. They're not necessarily software developers. 
Um, and as a result, you know, they're going away and they're doing their cool stuff on their laptop, but they're not necessarily familiar with your source control and how to actually integrate that in and work with their other team members. It's not that they don't want to work as a team. Um, it's just that they've not done it before. It's not their comfort zone. Um, so you do need to make sure that you've got people on the team with them that can kind of help them on that journey. Go right. It's okay that you don't get this this source control stuff and you know how to write all this code in a production way. Your skill is getting this algorithm done to the highest quality they can. And as long as you work with me on that, we can work together and we can, you know, say taking everyone on a journey together. If you know what I mean. But you can only do that if you've got different skill sets on the team. Great. Okay. If we use the analogy of baking a cake, then obviously there's going to be a bunch of ingredients that we need to to put into this. But let's get some context first. I, I mean, a data science team in uh, even across industries is going to be different, but certainly size of company, an enterprise, a midsize. And I guess there are some smaller companies that are, that are starting to build up that resource or have some access to that resource. Are we talking about all of those different size of companies or is this more of an enterprise discussion we're having? Mm, well, I think it obviously scales and how you would do it in the different companies is different, right? You look at the, the big organizations and they're, they're starting to break down actually. There's more than one type of data scientist and actually almost they're different things. You get things like machine learning engineers, AI engineers who, who take on maybe the more technical elements of the role and maybe data scientists sit back and are more business focused. Uh, but I think it's a very evolving language landscape like what one company calls a data scientist is very different to what another company might call a data scientist um so it, it's not always clean cut um thinking smaller organizations um you know you've got everybody and everybody wants to be called a data scientist right because it's the it's the cool job title to have everyone wants to be a data scientist you know we don't want to be a data engineer that's not cool um so it, it can be a lot more organic a lot more flat structured uh and it does take you know some good management to kind of say right well you this is your skill set really you're a data scientist yes but we need you working here and you working there and, and i think it, it works better if people are in the same room in my personal opinion Okay. All right. Let's let's get into that then. Let's uh, just quick shout out here. I see Danny Mars uh, jumped onto the live stream. Great to see you. Danny's over in Australia doing some incredible work uh, with his uh, community for AI and going on to build on that and deliver all sorts of wonderful things like courses. And more importantly, Danny's going to be on the Boundless Podcast and we're doing a live stream very soon. And given he's Australia, it's certainly probably rather late. Uh, so great to see you here. Danny, let's have your questions. And uh, it's starting to come in now. So we're talking about how to build high-performing data science teams. Jack, do you want to just do two sentences of introduction to yourself? Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, for the benefit of the audience. So, hi, I'm Jack Lawton. Um, I'm the data science principal at AMI. Um, we're an information management consultancy. Um, I've been at AMI for around five years. I actually joined AMI straight out of university where I studied physics. Uh, and I've uh, basically learned data science uh, on the job. Uh, it's something which I've become very passionate about uh, from all the different sort of angles of it, you know, the computer science side, the maths and physics side, which uh, I do have a personal soft spot for. And of course, the business context side as well, which is almost most important to think about when you talk about team. Now, let's talk about the process and we'll start with the hiring in just a moment. But we talked and we've got Dave Martin on the uh, live stream as well. Always great to see Dave. So he says, what about data science as a service? So before we go through this kind of life cycle of hiring and, and building and running a team, we talked about the different sizes of companies and, and Dave there saying, well, what about sort of access to data science and part time roles? Uh, are you seeing that? Is, that? is that quite difficult to integrate into a company or some success with that area? Well, it can be, I suppose I've got first-hand experience in kind of in being that service to go out and help smaller companies uh, establish their own data science practices. Um, and I think it absolutely can work. Uh, I'm personally very passionate about when you go in and you, as a service, you know, as a consultant, I go in and I want to try and help, you know, XYZ organization solve their data science problems. I'm very conscious that I want to do that in a way that works with the organization. So there's obviously twofold benefit to that. Uh, the first benefit is getting the expertise of their business experts. Like they, business context is hugely critical in any data science model. And you'd be a fool if you don't actually take their internal resource on board, even if they're not data scientists, as it were, 
and uh, learn from them and have them input into the model. Um, but then it's a two-way street, right? That gives me the opportunity to, you know, feedback. And I, I always try and make sure that I impart knowledge on the people I work with. And actually, I leave that organization in the best position for it. So essentially, I go there. I've delivered a lovely bit of data science work. And actually, they're in a position where, because they've helped me deliver it, they understand it. They understand how it works. They've built their own skills internally. And they can go away and continue to run and maintain that model without my assistance. I've not sort of... Uh, chained them into just buying me back in uh, it builds good rapport for me and it actually wins me future work in the future um but you know in a positive way where everybody can win great uh, dave do let us know if that answers your question so let's start at the beginning then you've got to got a hire and there's a lot of um challenge there isn't there about data engineers and data scientists mm. expectations of the role some of these are very high paid roles and then some i know some people feel they're underutilized for their expertise their mm. you know the, the work they've done in you know perhaps as a graduate and the sort of work that they're being put onto um what are some of the wins in that how do you hire well into a team I think the answer is with difficulty. I think you've just touched on a lot of the problems there where, you know, data science sort of suffers from being such a high profile like career that a lot of people want to do it and the expectations are set very high. Um, and as a result, not a lot of organizations are in the position to hire data scientists and have them do all of the stuff that kind of they enjoyed doing at university. When you think about, you know, really digging into the algorithms, looking at hyperparameters and things like that, you know, not only have you got things like AutoML coming in, but you know most organisations are so far behind in their kind of data engineering space and right, their platform space. Actually, having the capability to deliver those models into production is the real challenge, and that's what will end up occupying the vast majority of a data scientist's time. Um, so you need to be careful to hire and be honest about actually what the role is and what the expectations are of that role. I think it really depends on what you've got available. Um, we have a tendency to hire a lot of computer scientists. Computer scientists are obviously great because they, as part of their degree, they've been very hands-on um, with actually you know, doing coding and writing software. And those skills are very important for you know getting that data engineering in and making sure that it all links in in a way that it can actually get to production and get to the end user. Um, but they're not, of course, the whole picture. If you just get computer scientists in, you've not got much diversity of thought. You've not got people who are going to challenge the norm maybe people that understand the maths and the stats quite as well as you might want to, even if you are doing also ML, you need to be conscious that there are some assumptions that go into things that if you don't get your data set right at the start, you can end up with egg on your face, essentially. Um, so I think it's tricky because obviously then say you want to hire a mathematician or a physicist or indeed someone direct off a data science course. Um, and you might need a little bit more time to upskill them on the, the kinds of skills that, you know, aren't, the glamorous ones, the you know, the computer science skills, you know, coding skills. Um, if you've got a large enough team, you can obviously have a bit of flex, um, but it's more difficult for a company just starting out. I say it, it kind of links back to data science as a service. I mean, I've been in to an organisation that didn't have a data science team where they started off with a team where it was entirely contract resource. Um, so there was uh, myself and a few other consultants were in there, and we were the data science team. There was a data science manager who was that organization, and then the rest of us were consultants. But what that enabled us to do was kind of, because we all came with experience, we were able to define how that team worked, how it fit into the organization, what it did, and how it justified its own value. And then over time, they were able to gradually hire in their own resources and rotate the contract resource out, now to the point where that team is the majority of their own employees. And let's say you had two similar CVs on your desk. What sort of things would you look for? You mentioned diversity of thought. Are you looking at some of the soft skills? A two-part question there, really. How do you choose who you want for a team? And, and how do you make sure that you are building a team and you haven't just got a cookie-cutter uh, graduate, say, coming out of university? Because uh, dare I say it, I'm sure they're all different heights and colors and backgrounds <laughs> and whatever, but you can still have a real cookie cutter there, couldn't you, if you're not careful around the way that they think yeah. and the way they want to do things, right? You you really can. You're absolutely right. And I think, you know, the it's kind of the, the lazy way of doing it is just making sure that you've got a diversity of, of courses from a kind of university education perspective. But mm -hmm. really, I think you, you want to be broader than that, don't you? I and mean, some of the best data scientists, or at least one of them anyway, that I've worked with, 
Um, he wasn't university educated. He left school at 18 and he went. He worked his way up. He started as a database analyst and he worked his way up learning SQL, getting naturally into data science and actually went on to become you know, really senior and quite an inspiration to myself in my own journey. But would I hire someone straight out of university with only A-levels when I've got someone with a university degree sat next to me? I'm like, I don't know. And I think that's a real problem that I think more broadly in data science, a lot of people face. You have to filter down the CV somehow, um, but in doing so, you will see setting yourself up to have that, that cookie cutter just by marrying it down that way. That must be really tricky because people go to a lot of effort and money to get their masters and, and beyond. Mm -hmm. And they do that because they want to have a CV on your desk, Jack, and, and that you go, wow, you know, that's that's clearly somebody of, mm -hmm. of great credibility. So how would somebody who's come out of school at 16 or 18 but built up the skills, how would they appeal to you? What kind of things could they do to get on your radar? Yeah, no, good question. I think um, if you just come out of school, right, or even this, the same applies to university students as well, right? Um, it's actually, you know, it's the cheesy story, it's doing stuff outside of your course and your education. I think particularly in data science, I know this is starting to change as we get more data science courses, master's courses, conversions courses available at universities. Um, but even with those, I think you'll see you're following along, you've got a problem that's been set by your lecturer, the data's usually actually already clean, uh, and you've not really faced a lot of the real world challenges that you might face in a data science role. So what's always good to see is someone who's kind of gone off beast a little bit and they've, they've had a go at doing some data science themselves outside of formal education. Um, and even if they've completely failed, they've probably got a lot of valuable experience in dealing with messy data, actually accidentally producing an algorithm which is 100% accurate and not realizing why. And those things happen in the real world. And if you've not really got any experience doing that, that might come as a surprise to you in a data science job. So someone who's gone off and, and done things and hacked about a little bit, um, you know, be that going to hackathons or just for personal projects, maybe they've done a mod for a game or something cool like that. That that sort of stuff is what stands out to me on CV. Uh, Danny Mars asked another question, and I'll come to that in just a second. But what about risk, Jack? How much risk taking do you i mean i'll give you a quick story i was uh, karting for a friend's uh, stag weekend a few years ago and every single corner i would um smash into the back of the cart in front of me the guy in front of me was a pharmacist i was an enterprise sales guy my tolerance for risk and his tolerance for risk were not the same when it came to corners. But then mm. I thought, wow, I'm, I'm really glad I'm not a pharmacist with that level of tolerance. That's not, you know, you don't want someone like me giving out meds going, yeah, let's give it a go. Let's give it a try. <laughs> that, that's, that's the wrong profile for the role, isn't it? So what, what do you look for there? How fast do you want them taking corners? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a very good question. And I think data science is always a funny one, right? In the, it's a science, that's uh, part of the name, right? You go out and you, you test a hypothesis and it may or may not be true. This is always something which is always really difficult to convince in, in a business context is to get it. Actually, I'm gonna sink six months of time into this and I might come back with absolutely nothing. <laughs> so I think because there is that great unknown, um, you do have to be a risk taker to be a data scientist. Um, I think you know, you've gotta be prepared to go, I'm gonna go out on a limb and I'm gonna try something new do something adventurous and see what comes out of it and be prepared that you know you might crash into the car in front of you. Um, obviously that needs managing appropriately. You want your data scientists to have that spirit, but you need to make sure that it works in a, in a business context and your team is delivering value. But I think the the ethos of you know risk taking is very important. Right. It makes a lot of sense. So let's let's just put Danny's question up. We touched on this just a moment ago around setting the context for our discussion around smaller to larger businesses. So I'll read this out. Uh, does Jack find it hard to do this team building approach for larger established companies versus smaller teams companies? That's, I know you've made a couple of points, but just touch back on that and then we'll, we'll take Martin's uh, question in a second. Mm, yeah, I suppose it's, it's a bit different. right? With a, with a smaller company, you might find that they grow into having a data science team naturally. Um, and I suppose in that sense, it's a little bit e easier. Whereas obviously if you have a larger company, um, you're probably gonna have a lot of people who want to do data science, who are sort of siloed in different areas of the business. Um, and you know, although they're thinking about it, there's no joined up approach. 
Um, and actually, those people, some of the most valuable people in your organization, because you've already got them, they're committed to your organization, and they want to do data science, they want to start you on that journey. Um, but finding a way to enable that, obviously, isn't always the easiest. There's lots of security issues come up that you wouldn't have in a smaller company. It's like, actually, this guy wants to do data science, but do I really want to give him access to all that data and let him go wild on it? Probably not. But also, if you want to achieve that value, you have to be able to, to get him that data and give him the ability to do that. So I'm a big believer in sort of citizen data scientists and having a community of practice for data science in organizations like that, where you can actually enable those people to have those conversations and you know start to begin a joint up conversation about how we can start to do those things. I'll prioritize the questions from our um, attendees today on the live stream. But if I get a chance, I'd like to come back and ask you about hackathons there and where they might play into what you're talking about. So here's one for you, because I have no idea what the elephant in the room is. Martin, um, what, is yeah. <laughs> what is he referring to there, Jack, or do we need to push that back? Uh, have, have, you, have you turned around there, Richard? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay. All right. That's, uh, I can't even edit that out. Unfortunately, that's the downside of being live is when you miss an obvious joke like that. The elephant on my head, of course. All right. Thanks, Martin. Yeah. All right. But he's got a real question, so he'll spare my blushes. <laughs> How do you approach striking a balance between research and development versus product delivery? Great question. Yeah, that's very difficult. And it's a problem that I come up against all the time, right? Because especially as a consultant, right, I'm going in and I have to justify my own value. I'm going in there and I'm costing, you know, God knows how much a day. And, you know, these companies are paying for it because they expect me to deliver results. And the same is true for obviously data science teams in general, right? You're you're paying for have, to have this team, to support this team, this capability. And what's it actually doing for your organization? So obviously you do need to deliver stuff. You can't get away with not delivering stuff. But you also need to develop stuff, sorry, research stuff. Um, so obviously if you don't research, you'll just stagnate and you'll just end up turning into some sort of glorified support team, which obviously isn't good either. Um, what a lot of teams I've worked on do um, is they work agile, agile data science teams. Um, a lot of the parts of the agile manifesto do work for data science. I do have some niggles, which uh, if you've ever worked on a project with me, I will have raised. Um, but I think broadly speaking, <laughs> agile does work for data science. Um, and one of the sort of more um, modern adaptations on the agile manifesto, is something called a spike. Um, so the idea is you can have a spike in a sprint. Um, and what that will mean is essentially there's a deliverable. So for those who don't know Agile, it's basically the idea is you break your work up into sized work periods. So usually they're two weeks. So I've got two weeks. I'm going to do something in this two weeks. And I'm actually going to have something I can deliver at the end of it, something where I can stand up and say, I want to do this and I've done this. And Hopefully, if you planned it right, there might actually be some value you could associate with that thing done in that time box, even if it's a small one, or it's building towards a large value at the end. Um, but obviously, if you want to do research, it goes back to the old data science problem. It's a science. You're testing a hypothesis. You don't know if it's going to work or not. So how can I define what my outcome is going to be and what I'm going to do in those two weeks and stand by it at the end? Um, so the idea is that you have something called a spike. Uh, and what the spike is essentially I like to think of it as a task for your sprint where the output is a report. It's quite literally, I've gone away and I've researched this and I've had a play and this is my result. My result might be that I found absolutely nothing of value, but that's okay because it was in my spike. You know, I, wasn't, I didn't need to. Um, and I think a lot of the um, team that I've worked with, they do one spike a sprint. So I think they have one person go off and do some research and then the rest of the team continue on you sort of the main development for whatever you know, production features they're working on. And they obviously rotate. So everyone gets a hand at the, the research out of Great. Um, that's fantastic. Martin, do let us know what you think of Jack's answer there. If you have any follow-up questions, uh, I see uh, Danny's put, thanks, Jack. So uh, obviously you got some value from your answer as well. We're going to play catch up. We've got about three or four questions now, um, Jack. So let's see if we can do a bit of rapid fire on this. Um, I'm going to go to, I've just seen Ryan Moore's arrived. Hello, Ryan. Um, published the podcast this morning with Ryan and Fritz Bussemaker. I uh, hope you enjoyed uh, recording that, Ryan. I had a blast with you and Fritz. Uh, Niraj Satpal is, is here. Great to see Niraj, part of the community. Uh, always like to see his name popping up. 
So here we go. What data scientists need to do when they get overwhelmed with lots of data and are subjected to the pulls and the pressures from different stakeholders with different analysis. So remember, we've got to catch up some questions, but I mean, it's a, it's a good one there. How would you answer that? Yeah, no, that's a good one. And it's definitely one I'm familiar with. Um, I've, a lot of teams that I've worked with, um, we've actually found particular success by having a dedicated business analyst on the team, um, essentially almost a buffer uh, between your data scientists and the business. It's not that data scientists shouldn't be talking to the business because they absolutely should, um, but obviously data scientists are analytical people, they're techie, they're scientists, they like to get their head down and crack on. Um, and obviously if they've got this push and pull, um, they can't do that. Um, so having a physical person there as a barrier who's happy to sort of deal with those stakeholders and takes a little bit more joy in it than maybe your stereotypical data scientist might is always a good idea. I suppose another way to manage that is again through Agile. Um, one of the beauties thing, beautiful things about Agile is you plan out a sprint at the start of that sprint, you agree we're going to work on that sprint and for that the next entire sprint period you do not work on anything else, right? Unless it's incredibly important, you know, like business critical stuff. It's the answer is, right, well, that's fine. We'll capture that requirement and it's going to go in the backlog and we'll prioritize it in the future. And that's a good way to help manage the workload as well. Great. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Niraj, hopefully that's a useful answer to you. Uh, let's pop up Ryan. Uh, Ryan, I... Uh, I believe is a colleague of yours as well. So that's uh, fantastic that he's joining today and uh, couldn't help notice your coffee mug. Do you want to hold it up? Oh, yes. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Oh, Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> so he's leaning into that mug and, and asking, what do you recommend? Is it the Captain Kirk yeah. or the Spock approach to data science? Project? This is actually a, a, a gift from a data science team I worked on from a birthday a couple of years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what's the difference between a Captain Kirk and a Spock approach there to answer this question? How would you describe it? Yeah, that? I think they're very different, aren't they? Um, mm. Obviously, Captain Kirk, he's going to go in guns blazing, probably not sticking mm -hmm. by any of the Starfleet ideals. God knows how he got to be captain. Um, he's going to go in there and he's going to say, right, let's, uh, let's get the data. Let's stick it in a model. Let's see if there's anything there. And if there is, let's, let's stick it out there and we'll start using it. We'll go for it. Um, and that, that's the best one, is it? <laughs> well, not necessarily. <laughs> he's got to sit back, right? And he's gonna he's gonna take a more methodic methodical approach about it. He's gonna go right. Okay, I've got this data set. I've got this problem. Let's define what it is I want to do. Um, but the problem Spock has, right, is even though Spock's probably gonna come up with a better model because Spock's gonna think about it a lot more carefully, a lot more mathematically. Um, Spock might never get to the point where he's ready to jump. Spock might be sat there working on his data science model you know, for weeks and weeks and weeks. And actually he's got to a model that's 80% accurate, but Spock won't have anything less than 90%. That's not good enough. But actually, you know, Kirk would say, come on Spock, you've done your part of the job. You've got the 80%, let's get that into production, you know, start getting some value from it. Otherwise we're just wasting money, time and effort. Um, I think Spock and Kirk work best together, right? Star Trek, they're best friends. Um, and that's because they complement each other and they know they do. Um, so I think, Yes. The same is true in data science. Ah, oh, that's a wonderful answer. And, you know, good enough at some point has to be good enough. The exponential cost is of trying to get from 80 to 90 to 95 to what, you know, they're really incremental gains are very expensive. And even the best bridge in the world has got a load capacity. <laughs> they just have to choose a number, don't they? And that's that. Uh, Ryan, great to see you. Thank you so much. Let's go back to one of Danny's questions. He's got plenty on his mind uh, today. Uh, what's your view on data science becoming more of a consulting and a design discipline as opposed to a purely technical pursuit? Well, uh, as a consultant. <laughs> uh, but no, it, it, it's interesting, isn't it? I think, again, this got feeds back in, in my head, at least, to some of the auto ML stuff, right? Um, where actually the, the, the technical part of the job where you're sat there and you're you're going through oh i could use this algorithm or that algorithm and you know, how am i going to tune my hyperparameters um that part of the job is being sort of taken away in, in a sense by some of this sort of ml stuff you've got a lot of these very powerful cloud platforms you know microsoft google uh, amazon are all working on these things right well you can go in and it's a drag and drop interface it's like i want to do you know you've got to make two choices right uh, am I going to do a regression model or am I going to do a classification model? Uh, and that's, that's your choice, right? Um, and then it's just going to do all, all the other stuff for you. Um, and as I mentioned before, I 
although it, it does change what the expectation is of a data scientist, surely, certainly in more business context obviously there's still a role for data scientists who want to get in and write the algorithms and really tune the hyperparameters because obviously someone needs to write that all to ml stuff um but it's maybe less important in your sort of typical business context uh and although it's a change in the role for a data scientist i don't think it's replacing the data scientist and i think it's an opportunity more than it is a risk it's an opportunity for data scientists to get more involved in the other parts of the data science process either side of that automated element where they could start to understand okay what features am i putting in you know things like is it responsible to use this feature is this an appropriate one to use or is there some ethical consideration here that i need to be mindful of or you know am i accidentally going to pass in some post hoc information the post hoc information is information that you only know after the fact so it can make your model look a lot better but then when you put it in production somehow it doesn't work uh, and knowing those sorts of things is not something which auto ml is going to tell you at least not yet um, so there's certainly a role for a data scientist there, and of course on the, the productionization side as well. You know, you've got your typical software devs, um, but they're software devs, right? They even more to ML, right? They don't fully understand all the nuances of how you might want to implement that in a production scenario. So you need support from a data scientist on that side as well. Mm. Yeah, make, makes good sense. Danny, hopefully that um, is a useful answer for you. Uh, always great to see Jerry, and Jerry's leaning in with, with a question now. There's, um, there's there's so much in diversity. And I was thinking as you were speaking there about, of course, somebody's experience level and how it sounds like it might be useful in that scenario you were describing to have some um, more inexperienced people, you know, people who, who who don't know what you don't do and therefore actually can help us break out of some of the, um, the old patterns that we get stuck in. But of course, some experience as well and, and taking something into production um, there's a lot of uh, a lot of gotchas there, aren't there, that you, you might not see until you do it. Uh, so Jerry's question is, you know, what emphasis do you place on diversity? If you want to bring in some of that experience, if not, take it your direction. But if you can address his question, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think as I've touched on a couple of times, I'm, I'm thought diversity is absolutely critical in building a high performing data science team. There are different elements to what it is to be a data scientist, right? You can be uh, you know, into the maths and the stats and actual ML, mo ML models. You might be more interested in databases and actually how things fit together from a more technical perspective, or you might be have more of a business hat on and actually say, okay, how does machine learning work in practice? And what does this really mean for us in a business context? So, you know, if I deploy this ML model, it's going to change the way my business operates. And that is a data science question because it changes the data set feeding back into your model. And, and those are all really important elements which you won't find someone usually, who is really passionate about all three of those elements. You know, unicorns don't exist. You're going to get people who tend to specialize in one thing or another. And obviously, the same applies to experience, right? You've got people that have been around for years and have got a, a set way of doing things versus your fresh fresh graduates who actually might be able to put a slightly different spin on things that those people who've been around for a little bit longer might not have thought of because they've, they've seen it too many times. Um, so having that kind of diversity is obviously really important. But obviously, the other sort of diversity, also the more physical diversity, um, you know, ethnicity, gender, and all of that. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and say you don't need that because you obviously do. Uh, you absolutely do. I think it's it's wrong. Data science, you know, as, as with a lot of IT um, fields, it really struggles um, with the diversity. And personally, I think a lot of the problem is the um, institutions that feed into the industry, right? you can't do much about the fact that you're not getting a diverse pool of graduates out from the universities and again they can't do much that they're not getting a diverse pool of school students applying to them um so it's a really big cultural problem and i think it's it's hard to tackle um i think you know diversity hires can be good right because you've got the opportunity if you can't aspire to what you can't see and i think it's always really good to put in the spotlight you know, people from minority backgrounds who are, you know, good at data science. And I'm always conscious that I'm not, and I'm sat here as a, a you know, role model to potential aspiring data scientists. And I'm sat here as a white man. Uh, there's unfortunately not much I can do about that. Um, but what I do try and do about that is outreach. And I think, you know, just making sure that we're getting out there, that everyone can do data science and sharing knowledge in a way that anyone that wants to learn data science anywhere with any background can pick it up in, in an accessible way is really important and i'm really passionate about doing that to obviously help generations to come 
Yes, and it's worth saying that. I mean, look, we are all what we are, and, and none of us can change any of that. And the opportunity for people like yourself and myself, and there's plenty of others in this community, is that we really take strides to understand the diversity thing, do a bit more than just read a couple of reports, and, and really understand the importance of it, and, and take the opportunities, right? I mean, when you get speaking opportunities, why not? You know, instead of seeing I'm going to do a talk, why not say, let me just run a, a panel here, let me bring in two or three people who can create that broader spectrum. Mm -hmm. So that's an opportunity we have, a big opportunity. Uh, I will just mention, so it's lovely to see messages like this. If you want to say who you are, because unfortunately LinkedIn likes its privacy settings, good for it. But it means that uh, we, we don't unfortunately know who you are. And we've got uh, another one here. So let's come to this question in just a second, actually. Let me just pop it out of the way for a second, because um, I guess what, what, I'm, what I'm wondering there about diversity Oh, we will just say there. So thanks for a wonderful and insightful answer from Jerry. That's, that's lovely, Jerry. Thank you. So, I mean, let's get down to brass tacks. I mean, in a country like the UK, obviously, we do have majorities of the type of people. So that is probably the majorities you CVs are going to see on your desk. And as you say, we're not encouraging enough, particularly women into STEM still. Hmm. Does that mean that you need to think about hiring around the world? I mean, COVID's put us all at our desk. Oh, yes. at home. So is is that what I mean? That's if you really want to get diverse, you'd surely have to go overseas, wouldn't you? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, organizations like Facebook, I know, have said, like, pretty much, like, actually, after COVID, we've gone remote and we don't actually think we need an office to operate anymore. And um, so from now on, we're going to hire internationally. And that obviously you know, brings various business benefits, right? Because if we're hiring internationally, um, salary standards to be blunt are different internationally which obviously is something you would need to control for if you're making those international hires um but you know that's an excellent way to try and achieve that diversity and obviously physical diversity does i believe breed thought diversity so you've got people from different backgrounds they have different ways of thinking and that's always a good thing to have um you know covid it's it's been a big big change the way we work um the way we you know do day science in a lot of ways but in a lot of ways it's the same um, personally, I've really struggled um, with um, actually, particularly mentoring. Um, you know, where I've got other people on the team who I want to be mentoring, and, and making sure that you know I'm there to support them if they get stuck, and sort of you know helping them learn and grow quicker. Um, if I'm not in the same room as them, I don't like to be there, sort of pestering them over the internet, going, oh, "How's it going? You know, how can I help?" All the time. Whereas, obviously, if I'm sat in the same room, I can. Just, over here and just be conscious of what's going on and you know step in to help as and when um, rather than being some sort of overbearing you know, big brother over the internet <laughs> like, tell me what you're doing please be productive um, so I really don't like that um, that I've really been struggling with and I think it is difficult obviously there's ways to mitigate it with regu regular catch-ups but I think as humans I think we never feel like it's quite the same um, so I am keen to get back to the office and i don't think i would ever want to go fully remote quite like facebook have done um but certainly from a you know we've got experienced people who have actually already met each other or know each other well um then it can work very well remotely i've been doing obviously a lot of work remotely um to help manage COVID. Um, and obviously there's a lot of high pressure data science problems that come up in that scenario um, and the team has worked fantastically well and we've been able to solve the problems, you know, I'd say actually to a degree that's just as good as we could have done if we'd been there in person. Um, but I'd say I think the longer term impacts to our sort of mental health and maybe personal development are things which we might struggle with. So, Tom, thank you so much for putting your name up there, Jack. Thanks for answering that question. Tom, do give us a shout if you've got any additional questions. Uh, we'll let us know if, if Jack's answered your question uh, as you hoped uh, he could and would. Uh, I'll pop up uh, Thomas's uh, URL here, ai4anyone.org. Good start, a feeder program focused on increasing diversity in younger people. Thank you very much, Thomas. I'll leave that on the screen a little bit longer. Um, I said I'd talk about hackathons a little bit earlier because we touched on Agile and we've been talking about distributed teams. Um, I, I, I get that a lot of people want to get involved in AI for good type of hackathons mm -hmm. uh, where you can see that you're helping a cause. Um, but um, is, is there a way for businesses just to get wider innovation onto one of their projects through a hackathon? Or is that more difficult? Do you have to find some sort of reward and recognition or, or compensation scheme to do that? Um, 
And uh, he's running a hackathon. Have you, is that a hybrid kind of hackathon? Is that just an AI for good hackathon? Is that um, going to feed into your own work? What's the story? Yeah, so it's, it's a water industry um, hackathon. So we're doing that with Anglian Water, Welsh Water and SSE. Um, and we're really interested in, you know, they've got some unique problems that they're trying to solve. Um, and actually, it's a thought diversity thing, once again, I'll say. It's actually doing this hackathon in such an open way that anyone can get involved. Is that you've got a pool of people who might be completely alien to the utility sector and these problems. And what that means is they're going to come in with a fresh face with a new angle on that. Um, and they're actually maybe going to think about things in a different way, uh, which would be very insightful. Uh, sort of hackathons in a lot, of, in a larger sense for us as Amy, and very much inspired by our relationship with Northumbrian Water, where I'm working at the moment. Northumbrian Water run uh, an innovation festival. Um, every year, um, it's always an in-burst event, and they run it in uh, Newcastle at the race course. It's always great fun. Um, but what they do is they really encourage people from all kinds of backgrounds, as people across their organisation. So uh, you know that could be you know, board members, and, you know, people in senior management positions who maybe wouldn't ordinarily get involved in some of these day-to-day -day data problems, um, as well as you know the people who are living or even those problems down external people. Uh, they like to invite along customers. Uh, and people from local universities. Uh, and bringing all those different heads into the same place is a really good way to think a little more radically about the art of the possible and what you could do rather than sitting with your own preconceptions. Um, it's also, you know, particularly for Amy, I would say, uh, a great recruitment tool when you think about how we can um, interact with universities and actually get students coming in and saying, yeah, Amy, you're doing some pretty cool stuff. I'd like to work with Amy. It's a good way for us almost to do a soft interview and uh, pick out these students which are really good and really engaged um, that we might want to hire. So there's lots of benefit to it. Um, I sense that's still a big opportunity for businesses like yours and, and others that um, the, the way that you talk, your tone of voice out and, uh, you know, everybody knows that businesses care more about just hard profitability these days, or at least we hope they do. And you know, I don't think we need to see, you know, Amy planting trees every day. We, we get you're a business and you want to get on and do business. But within that space, there's this real tone, isn't there? The real kind of way to relate to a business and understand what, what you guys care about, what you're thinking about, what worries you, um, you know, what, what sort of you know success and, and mean looks like for you in your life. And just telling those stories, I feel, is... So it's what we want, really, for businesses. Yeah, and I think it's, it's a big part to like, who we are. Like we we want to, you know, employ people who genuinely care and who want to do good in the world. Uh, and you know, our customers see that, and it, it, it's part of our our value, right, as a consultancy. Why you want to get Amy in? Um, so I think you know, it helps. It pays to be good, if you know what I mean. It, it works for us. Uh, it's just being honest and true to ourselves is part of who we are as Amy. Yeah, and I feel very passionate about that. And I, as a, you'd expect, I wouldn't spend so much time and support your company and uh, you support us if that wasn't the case. I uh, really appreciate the work that Amy does. I think it's the it's a great model, and it's but it's a business model. You know, it does well. Right? That's great. Too. <laughs> yeah, 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 still a business. <laughs> oh, absolutely, not, nothing wrong with that at all. Yeah. Um, so we'll we'll start to uh, come to a, a close on this one. Uh, so give me give me a last question. If somebody else jumps in, I'll take theirs. But um, uh, Bridges, so how, how do you stop this team being siloed? I mean, I know that everybody's remote, but kind of emotionally siloed in the organisation. How, how do you connect Bridges back from this team into you know the senior management office, leadership office, the stakeholders? Because people talk different language, don't they, in business? Yes, yes, they do. Um, and this can be tricky, right? Um, I think a lot of it, um, particularly when you're talking about building a data science team, it comes from relationship building, right? Um, and what you don't want that team to be is a silo in and of itself. Obviously, I think one of the ways you can help that is with things like citizen data scientists, where you've got these people all across the business who've got contact in different areas who can help you build those bridges and actually step in two conversations at you know, different levels and different parts that you might not be able to do if you just had an isolated data science function. Um, a lot of it's time as well. It's just making sure that you get the conversations with the right people and it's taking them on that journey. It's allowing them to be a part of the data science process and to see the value firsthand and what it means. 
and you start to build that favor up uh, and it will come back around. Thank you. Well, we're literally just on 45 minutes, uh, which is what we intended to run for. Uh, so I say thank you to Tom and Thomas, Jerry, uh, Danny, uh, Ryan, and uh, uh, <laughs> Jerry. Did I say Jerry already? <laughs> I think I did, yes. There we go. I like, that's how much I like Jerry. And uh, Martin, Niraj, and uh, uh, Kunal, and Dave Martin, who, who joined us as well at the start of this. But mostly, Jack, of thank you to you. It's incredible that you would put down your tools for a minute, put down your duties, and spend a bit of time with the community. Help us to understand and grow in our roles and in our leadership and in our teams to make sure that we, we do the best that we can for business, society, the community at large. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, no, it's absolutely my pleasure. Of course, I'm itching to get back to development, of course. So. <laughs> of course. <laughs> okay, my pleasure. And uh, no, thank you for putting these on, Richard. They're, they're always really insightful. And it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. And finally, Jack, was it was it the hot seat or was it the comfortable armchair this afternoon? Um, I think it was the comfortable armchair. I think it was. Uh... <laughs> then we need to get you in the hot seat next time, then. Yeah, yeah, no, please. A more difficult topic, please, next time. <laughs> <laughs> See you soon, Jack. Yeah, no, lovely. Thank you very much. Bye, everybody.